Good morning. Great to see you all. I'm, I'm Pastor Dave. I'm thankful to be with you this morning. I have my Bible open to John chapter 16, where we just were. Uh, we'll be flipping between there and John 14 and all over, but we'll, we'll focus on what Jesus said about the coming Holy Spirit to his disciples on the night he was betrayed. Before we get there, I want to share with you that this Friday, August 4th, there will be a celebration of life for Debbie Rickard. That'll be at 11 a.m. right here, and there will be uh, a meal served afterwards so you can get together uh, for a reception that our deacons will serve. This is part of the life of faith. We celebrate births, we celebrate baptisms and new life, we celebrate weddings, we celebrate repentance and renewal and marriage. We are with each other in the hard times. We're with each other celebrating Christ's triumph over death at funerals. And so come and you can support Kent and the family. It is sane to be sad about sad things. We can grieve together, but we grieve with hope as we stand on the solid ground of Christ and his resurrection. Second thing that I wanted to share with you, uh, it's, it's somewhat embarrassing to share, but I feel uh, that it's really important. So two weeks ago, I was preaching, sharing about Jesus. And in the midst of that, I shared a story that I was delighted to find on the internet. That should raise a red flag. So it was, it, this is a, a, a quick little um, word about the danger of lightly believing things that we want to be true, which is what our neighbors call confirmation bias. I shared a story about Thomas Paine, uh, early American intellectual and atheist, and turns out a dear woman in our, our church was interested in the story, went and looked into it, and before too long realized that story was not true. And so uh, I repent of that because I was breaking the ninth commandment. <laughs> that uh, is wrong. I share this with you both to repent of it and to commit to do better, but also to remind you, dear ones, that we're the people of the truth. And so when we... Uh, are living in the world, we're going to encounter a lot of stuff that's just not true, especially on the internet. Come on, Pastor Dave. <laughs> but uh, one, we should be very careful when we bear witness to Jesus that we care a lot about the truth and we care enough about it that we can say we were wrong when we get it wrong. Okay? All right. So I'm learning. We can all learn together. Let's go on to the Holy Spirit as we are rooted in the essentials as a community of faith. What comes to mind when you think of the Holy Spirit? Maybe you think of a guy dressed in a white suit. He's surrounded by a whole auditorium of people and they come up to be healed and he pushes them down on the stage. They wanted to be healed. What's going on? And then maybe you think when you think of the Holy Spirit, you're thinking of a similar auditorium, but dark, lights low, and there's smoke filling the room, and an awesome guitar solo starts getting ripped out. Woo! All right. Maybe, is that what you think of when you're thinking of the Holy Spirit? When we read the scriptures, we might think of something very different. We might think of a desert place full of bones. Those familiar with the scriptures, like Jesus and his disciples, were aware of, of this moment when God gave a prophet named Ezekiel a vision. He was in a hard moment, right? He wasn't living in prosperity, right? He, he had no auditoriums to go to to worship with God's people. <laughs> but he was living in exile, and he's looking to God in hope. And in the midst of that, God gives him this vision. And he says, that his people are like a bunch of dry, dead, disconnected bones. Wow, what a hopeful vision, right? But it keeps going because the Lord says to, the, to this prophet Ezekiel, prophesy over the bones. Can, can these bones live? The Lord asks him, I don't know, but you know, Lord. So he prophesies over the bones and the bones rattle and stand and come together and fasten into skeletons and sinews and muscles come upon them. But they're not yet fully alive. So the Lord says to Ezekiel to prophesy to their breath, <laughs> that they would have living breath, the very breath of God within them. So he starts prophesying, and the, it's as though the winds come from every direction and fill these skeletons, which now are a living army, standing Godward, ready to serve him, fully alive with the life of God in them. 
And the Lord would do this for his people. This is the promise. This is what they were waiting for. But what this picture points us to is the reality that apart from God, we're dead meat. We're dead meat. We're just, we're just lifeless. We're just wandering about. We'll, we'll look at Paul's description of us, which is, is similar, but in, in a funny way different. It's almost like, um, you know, the, the armies of the night, if you've watched those, those old movies, or, or The Walking Dead, where you have these creatures that are dead, but just wandering around, aimless, without purpose, not serving God, just serving their passion in the moment. Spiritually dead, not seeking God, not serving anyone else. But not only this, they're, they're disconnected. The bones were just separated. And even more so, even coming to life, apart from the power of God, these dear ones are not able to convince anyone else that there is life in God available to them. And on this side of Jesus and the resurrection, we can't convince people that Jesus is Lord, that there's eternal life to be found in him. We need God to awaken others to life even once we've been awakened to life. And this is how the disciples were. They were alone. They were feeling the impending absence of Jesus they were grieved to their hearts because he says he's going away from them. And they've heard him talk about the cross and it's starting to hit. Oh, you're, you're actually going to walk down into the city and be betrayed and crucified? So they're, they're afraid. And they're wondering what's going to happen to them. In the middle of this, Jesus says to them in the beginning of John 14, after he's actually said to Peter that he would betray him that night, that he would deny him. He says, but don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he says it again. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is coming to troubled hearts when he talks about the Holy Spirit. And there in the midst of, of looming cross death, the promise of God is going to be offered and fulfilled. This promised Holy Spirit Remember from the very beginning, we, we talked about the Holy Spirit when we talked about the Trinity a couple weeks ago, how he is fully God, how he was partnering in the work of creation with the Trinity in the beginning, hovering over the creation in Genesis 1-2. But even in the days of Moses, that great prophet who lived, say, 1,200 or 1,400 years before Jesus and led God's people out of slavery, Moses longed to see the day when God's spirit would be poured out. In Numbers 11, I think it's verse uh, 29, Moses says he longs that all of the people could prophesy, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all of them. And there's a desire that the spirit would be poured out without measure on all flesh, that sons and daughters would prophesy, that old men might have new kinds of dreams and hope and life in God when the Holy Spirit is poured out. This is the hope that's lying beneath this fear in these disciples. And I just ask you today, as people learning to follow Jesus, a disciple-making family, and people maybe coming from the outside, maybe just peeking in, wondering what this Jesus stuff is all about, why does the Holy Spirit matter today? Why is this essential to us? Because, friends, the Holy Spirit breathes the life of God into his people. He breathes the very life of God and to his people. So I'm going to pray and then uh, we'll, we'll dig into how Jesus unpacks this promise. Father, thank you for this life you offer. And I pray now that as we look to your word that you would pour out your spirit on us, that you would accompany your word with your spirit. This, after all, is the sword of the spirit. So we open up our chests to receive it. We ask that you would do your work. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is it like to be alive in God? If, if the Spirit of God breathes 
life into the people of God? What is it like to be spiritually alive? Well, the first thing that Jesus is encouraging his disciples about is that to be alive in God is to have the presence of God by the Holy Spirit. So John chapter 16, we're looking at verse 5. Remember, Jesus is trying to encourage them. Their hearts are grieved. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. They're feeling like they're going to be abandoned. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus says, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, what is Jesus doing in this moment? Is Jesus doing what we often do, where we say, well, it's all going to be fine, it's going to be okay, really it's better this way, right? Empty promise, a little spiritual band-aid. Is that what Jesus is doing? No, but we might feel that way. If we put ourselves in the disciples' shoes, they've, they've walked with him in the flesh, they've seen his face, they've experienced his love, and now he says he's going away. How could anything be better than that? How could it? The only way that I could possibly believe that it could be better is if Jesus himself told me. <laughs> Jesus who is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus who, loving his disciples, loved them to the end and washed their feet this very night. Because he says it, I, I, I trust him. Something could be even better. So just imagine with me, what could be even better? What if the nearness that Jesus had with his disciples, what if we could have something that's even nearer? And that's what Jesus had already said to his disciples. Back in chapter 14, verse 18, he's talked about how he's going to ask the Father and give you another helper to be with you forever. He says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you. And in the previous verse, he's just said, you know him, you know this helper, for he dwells with you and will be in you even closer than Jesus, who is right with them, who even embraced them, but the Holy Spirit would be in them and with them forever. The very presence of God with them forever. No trite word band-aid, but truth to stand on. And this is what it's like to be alive in God. Now, where do we experience the presence of God? It, you know, the disciples are in this upper room with Jesus. We remember, as, as we'll talk about in a moment, how they waited for the Holy Spirit to descend upon them in that upper room after Jesus had ascended. But where, where do we experience the Spirit? Now, in both Old and New Testaments, the word for Spirit suggests wind, breath, something that's active and vital. And if we're going to catch the wind, right, if we're going to go sailing or something, we need a good sail, but we also have to have a little bit of wisdom about how to catch the wind well. If you saw someone in the garage with, let's say, a, a big kite, and they're trying to get their kite to go in their garage with the door down, right? And they're just knocking stuff down off the ceiling they've got stored. They're messing up their kite. It's getting tangled up in a knot. You say, what on earth are you doing? If somebody goes into the forest, you know, everybody in Colorado, we love the wonderful forest, the National Forest of Colorado. Somebody's out in the forest of Colorado with a kite, and they're trying to get their kite to go. What are you doing? This is not where you're going to catch the wind in a way that's going to lead to takeoff, right? But I think sometimes we, as individualists, Western individualists, we think, well, I can just go experience God's presence wherever, however I want, right? That's kind of a, a notion that's in us. But where has God promised by his spirit to meet us that his wind will blow? Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you. And Jesus says, elsewhere, in Matthew 18, he says, Whether two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be. He comes to us when we gather in his name, in his body. We are the body of the Spirit. We are the dry bone army that's made alive by the Spirit together. He didn't just animate individual so soldiers. He's building an army, a gathering of people. So find a community of Jesus followers. You'll find the Spirit there. And furthermore, find how do you know a community of Jesus followers? It's a people that's marked by, anchored in, 
the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. It's the people who look to God in His Word, right? Who listen to this God-breathed, which suggests the Holy Spirit's action in the Word, right? This God-breathed witness. This is our life. We put up our sails and we wait on the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, you know, we, we sense that presence, right? It's like we feel and like we know we're here. But I caution you, it's not like every time you get goosebumps, that means the Holy Spirit is specially acting in your life. You know, I watch a good Disney movie, and I can be like, Raya and the Lost Dragon, and the little dragons are coming out at the end, and it's all okay, and I'm like, oh, is that the Holy Spirit? You know? No. But we can be confident that the Spirit works among His people when we're gathered and we're worshiping Him. Even more, God says that he inhabits the praises of his people. When we come together, when we praise him, when we're devoted to his word, we've got our sails up and the, the Lord just meets us. We may not feel it, but we know it's true because he has said it, right? We have his promise, which is more sure than our feelings. At least it's true in my life. My feelings are a lot less reliable than God's word. I think you'll find that true as well. So being alive in God by the Spirit means we have the presence of God. Secondly, though, just to reemphasize this and go deeper, it means that we are a people anchored in the Word of God. In the Word of God. Look at chapter 14, verse 26, and then uh, we'll also be over in 16, 13. 14, 26, though. Jesus has spoken to his disciples, spoken to y'all. Remember, in this moment, he's speaking to his disciples in this upper room. He's speaking to them. It's beneficial for us, but we have to remember he's speaking to his disciples. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach y'all all things. Who is y'all? The disciples. The disciples. And bring to y'all's remembrance all that I have said to y'all. The Lord Jesus is going to bring to remembrance all that he has said to them. In chapter 16, verse 13, again, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide y'all into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to y'all the things that are to come. Why does this matter? Why does it matter, first, that the apostles received the Holy Spirit in a way that they could remember everything that the Lord Jesus had spoken to them. Why did that matter? It matters, friends, because we are dependent upon their words to know the Lord Jesus because they wrote the New Testament. The God-breathed witness of the apostles is the basis of our faith in Jesus today. Jesus is proclaimed, even displayed to us by faith when we take up the words of the New Testament and read because the Holy Spirit does more than what mere human words can do. These are God-breathed words, the words of the apostles. And not only the things of Jesus and the things of how to live in Jesus that we see in the, the writings of people like Paul and the letters, but even of things to come. As we see there in chapter 16, verse 13, he speaks of things that are to come. And so we see hints of that in the letters and certainly in the revelation that God would give John on the island of Patmos. So this matters, friends, that the Holy Spirit led them into truth because now we, how are we led into truth? This is another moment where we can be really silly, guys. You know, we're like the people in our garage with our kite because we're like, oh, Lord, lead me into the truth. Holy Spirit, tell me what to do. And we're not opening this up. <laughs> Guys, where has the Holy Spirit spoken? Where has he offered you the hope of eternal life? Where has he given you the wisdom you need to navigate marriage and life and parenthood and just the basics of wisdom and faith and repentance? Where has he spoken? It's not alone out in the forest, although you'll encounter the glory of God out there. It's there, but it's not sufficient. It's in his word. 
here you encounter the Holy Spirit. I said, a boring, boring sermon, Pastor. You're just saying, read the Bible. Yep. <laughs> but nor is this mere formalism. Some people would hear this and say something like, well, you're, you're constraining the Spirit because you're saying he can only work by his word. And I would just say, no, the Spirit graciously chooses to work by His Word. But the thing is, you can have all the knowledge of the Word. And this is something we have to be careful about faith. We're a people of the Word. That's our first value is being biblically grounded, right? We've got to be careful because there's a guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, he was an earnest man who loved the Bible. And he goes to Jesus in the night because he wants to hear more about this rabbi who clearly is teaching the things of God. But it's so different than the things he'd heard before. So he goes to him in the night so no one else knows about it. And he is asking him questions. But Jesus shocks him by just saying this thing that sounded outrageous to him. You know, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. You need the Holy Spirit to give you new life. And Nicodemus is just, you know, he's befuddled. <laughs> he's baffled. What, what, what on earth does that mean? You know, could I enter back into my mother's womb? How, how could I possibly be born again? That, that doesn't make any sense, Jesus. And Jesus says, you're the teacher of Israel. And what does that mean? That means that he is a rabbi of rabbis. Now, any student would be raised to memorize large portions of the Torah. Rabbis often would seek to memorize the entire Torah, the first five books of Moses. The greatest of them seeking to memorize even more. Even today, you can find the Torah in Hebrew set to song. This is kind of how they would do it. But you can have the whole Bible memorized, guys, and yet be like dry bones in a desert because those words have not taken root in your heart because the Word of God has not yet become your life by the work of the Spirit in you. See, these words, powerful as they are when the Holy Spirit speaks them into us, are words printed on a page or recited by a rabbi or another person until the Holy Spirit takes those embers and breathes his fire upon it. And then when we hear the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That message Jesus tells to Nicodemus on that night. When we hear that and we believe, that's all enabled by the gift of the Holy Spirit coming alongside the Word, the power of God coming alongside the Word of God. John 16, verses 8 through 11. What does the Spirit do that we can do? Well, when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. These words don't just hit us and bounce off. They, they bury deeply because the Spirit drives them into our hearts and convicts. And He's talking about the world. That means us before we believe in Jesus, that means any dear ones, any dear neighbors that are looking in today that haven't yet trusted in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, when he speaks to you, will convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, verse 9, because they don't believe in me. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit reveals the beauty of Jesus and the truth of Jesus to you so that you realize all those days that I didn't follow him, all those days that I rejected him, all those days I ignored him, that was a cosmic betrayal <laughs> of God, of, of my purpose. I've sinned. Suddenly sin has a definition. And concerning righteousness, because Jesus is going to the Father. You see, after this moment, we don't have that in-person picture of Jesus in Palestinian flesh with dark curly hair and beard and smelling of Near Eastern food, right? We don't have that experience in the same way as the disciples had. So how can we see the righteousness of God with us? Well, we can see it when the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to our hearts by faith in his word. And we see the beauty of his life and the ugliness of ours. And we see, oh no, <laughs> we see this righteousness and our need for it. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged, the Holy Spirit puts a holy fear in us that God is righteous to condemn all evil, especially the evil one, the ruler of this world that John speaks about, the one who rebelled even before the beginning of this story. 
but who entered in in Genesis 3 and would deceive and lead our first parents to, to fall. This way leads to death. And the Holy Spirit makes that mean something to us. That's a joke to many of our friends. The devil's a joke. It's a cartoon, right? The Holy Spirit takes that joke <laughs> and fills us with holy fear at the reality that apart from Jesus, we will perish eternally in hell. And that's not just a preacher's tactic. <laughs> that's the truth of God that the Spirit of God reveals. So, when I first came here, you all asked me, someone you know, among you asked me, so, pastor, and this is all, every pastor's favorite question, how are you going to grow the church? <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm going to preach the word. <laughs> Why? Because it's only the Spirit of God working by the word of God that can give life to anybody right? I have no special tools. I'm not a magician, right? Nor am I going to try to use special manipulative tactics, which are very common in American churchianity, right? Where we, we, we try to lower the lights. We try to create an atmosphere. I have no problem with lights or atmosphere, but my question is, where's the Word of God? Where's dependence on the Spirit of God? Because by my human means, I can do nothing of eternal significance. But with God, all things are possible. So, we need the Spirit of God. The one who alone can make us alive together with Christ. Right? Remember, it was the Spirit who, when you heard the gospel, the word of your salvation, and believed, he sealed your hearts to promise you of the good things to come, the inheritance that is yours in Christ Jesus. And it's that spirit breathed upon you when you believed, who when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, myself too, right? Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, another way of talking about the devil. I know that's cra crazy to say, but that's what we were doing apart from Christ. The devil can be subtle. Even when we were following that way, with all of the children of disobedience in the world, right then, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive, breathed life into our nostrils, and made us truly alive in Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And now he set us, who are walking in our sins, he set us to walk in the works that he's created us for from the beginning. To glorify Christ. That's what we were made for. And it's only by the Holy Spirit that we can recover this. He is bringing about a new creation. Chapter 16, again, in, in John's Gospel. He's going to declare to you the things that are to come. He'll glorify me, Jesus says. Chapter 16, verse 14. I hope you hear this. The ministry of the Spirit is to glorify Jesus. To take a people oriented to self, dead in their sins, breathe life into them so that now they recover their created purpose, glorifying the Son of God. And in fact, it's again only possible by the Spirit. Another wonderful passage in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, around verse 15, Paul talks about how there's a veil that's over the eyes of all who don't trust in Jesus. And, and we can't just take this veil off. We can't just trust in Jesus and will it out of ourselves, right? And I can't manipulate you by, by lowering the lights and putting in smoke machines and using great rhetoric, the best rhetoric that man can possibly come up with. I can't remove that veil. But, but he says, but we all beholding the glory of Jesus are being transformed with unfilled face, beholding the glory of Jesus, we're being transformed into his image. And this all comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. If you want that veil to be removed, if you want to be one who can see Jesus and delight him and know him and be transformed to become more like him, that's not a work that you can do on your own. It begins with saying, God, I need your help. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes and glorifies Christ in your heart and lifts your eyes to see the good news that Jesus is enough. And by his work, he's done all that is necessary to save you to the uttermost forever. And so, 
We need the word of God. We need the power of God. The sword of the spirit working in us. So when we talk about life in the spirit, some of us may just think to be spirit filled is to be excited. Really excited. Woo! Spirit filled. But I would challenge that notion. Excitement's great. I am not anti-excitement at all, and I think it's very exciting when someone comes to believe in Jesus and trust in his word. But I caution us, when we see being full of the Spirit in the New Testament, it's talking about depending on the word of the Lord, letting the word of God dwell in us richly, and it's talking about living a life of repentance and obedience. It's talking about real witness to God. So the Holy Spirit breathes life into God's people. Life in the Spirit is life in the presence of God, life anchored in the Word of God, life animated by the power of God and His Spirit. But then ultimately, we bear witness by the Spirit of God. And, and first of all, the Spirit bears witness in us. This is a wonderful promise of God that when we trust in Jesus, Romans 8 is another great place to go and camp and learn and marinate and learn about the Holy Spirit. But just one little section from Romans chapter 8 for today. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now remember, the Romans are Christians like the disciples who are experiencing real fear. Persecution, famine, nakedness, sword are real things they will face, right? They're going to be led as sheep unto the slaughter, it says in the same chapter. And yet, they've received a spirit of adoption. They belong in the family of God. They can relate to God intimately as their father. And the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There's an inward sense. Have you had this? An inward witness that God gives so graciously by the Holy Spirit to all his children, you're mine. And he ministers the sweet promises of God to your heart. I am a child of God. When the world says everything else about you, when you lose your job, when you lose your marriage, when your kids abandon you, when everything goes south and your health is failing, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And the Spirit still bears witness. And he'll never leave you. He's present, his word active and powerful. He's sealed you and he won't unseal you. But this inward witness then leads to outward witness, right? So in John 15, the disciples probably weren't excited about the context. Jesus is talking about them being hated. And in the next verses, he'll talk about how people will kill them thinking they're being obedient to God because they identify as Christians. They're going to be cast out of their synagogues. But in the middle of that, Jesus says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also, remember, y'all the disciples, will bear witness because y'all have been with me from the beginning. And you know what? This happened, guys. This is what Acts is about. They certainly did bear witness, didn't they? At the very beginning of Acts, we find out that Jesus promises his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But wait, wait until you're clothed with power from on high. But then that moment comes when the Holy Spirit descends upon them as they have their sails raised, they're waiting on the Lord, they're in prayer, they're looking to the scriptures together. And then the Spirit comes upon them in power. And they come out and bear witness to Jesus. They're preaching the good news that the Son of God, the King, has come. He has risen for the forgiveness of their sins and for the sins of the whole world. And he's, they're, they're, they're speaking with conviction in a way that cuts people to the heart. The Holy Spirit convicting of sin and righteousness and judgment. But the remarkable thing, even beyond all those amazing things, is that they're speaking in languages they don't even know. <laughs> All of the people from around the Roman Empire coming together for this festival and they're hearing the gospel in their own languages. It's a wonder. The Spirit bearing witness in this powerful moment to Christ. And we see the fulfillment of Joel 2 and that promise all along that God longed to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. 
I'll get to spiritual gifts in a minute. But first of all, we just see that disciples of Jesus are empowered by the Spirit for outward witness in our words. But not only in our words, but in our, our ways. In our ways. You see just in the next uh, section of Acts 2 and Acts 2.42 and following the ways of the disciples with one another devoted to the, to the word of God and to prayer, to fellowship, and the apostles' teaching, the breaking of the bread, and serving one another, sharing things in common. And we see the Spirit's work in Galatians highlighted. Not only words, but ways. So Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. If we believe that we can be filled with the Spirit on Sunday morning and return to a life like this for the next 167 hours, we are deceived. Paul says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, and notice it's one fruit. This isn't a la carte. You don't get to choose your fruit. There is one Holy Spirit. And in his grace and in his time, he is going to minister all his fruit, the character of God to you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Holy Spirit ministers these things to us as we look to Jesus in Scripture, as we find him beautiful, because our eyes have been unveiled and the power of God's at work with us. The power to live a basically faithful, repentant life. To show the world a picture of Jesus. That's what we're called to do. And when we do this, we're not just doing it alone, although we do. We gather and we scatter. But there's a special character to our communal witness, to our witness together, that is a light for the world that draws people into the life of God and the Spirit. We see this expressed in our gifts, the way we use our gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 1 through 7, the Apostle Paul talks about our gifts. Remember, we're talking about witness to God and life in the Spirit. So when we use our gifts, spiritual gifts, if you're a Christian, you've probably heard about this. If you're, if you're an other than Christian or someone newer to church life, this is one of the silly things that Christians like to have debates about. <laughs> But instead of engaging in debates, I want to point out some clear things about spiritual gifts. First of all, Paul says, to each is given, and to each, we're talking about believers who trust in Jesus, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It doesn't say the gifts of the Spirit are given to make you look exciting or interesting or special, to draw attention to yourself. Why did the Spirit come? To glorify Christ, right? The common good is served when Christ is glorified in this body and beyond. And so, the Spirit is given for the manifestation of the common good. Now, the Holy Spirit is sovereign. The same Spirit who gave the gift of languages to the apostles and this cohort of believers on the day of Pentecost is the same Spirit who is alive and reigning today. And so, I, I want to be open to what the Spirit will do. However, I want to be careful. Uh, when I was in high school, um, I was encouraged in, in a youth group setting uh, to receive the gift of tongues. And uh, so I tried really hard. So they told me how. They said, it's just like riding a bike. You just start doing it. And so I started trying to say things that sounded like gibberish that my neighbors were saying. And, you know, didn't do. But it was nothing from God. <laughs> it was me saying, didn't do. And I just want to caution us. When the Spirit gives gifts, He gives them sovereignly. He gives them in His time. He gives them in accordance with His Word. He gives them for the common good. He gave them on the day of Pentecost that all would hear and know the gospel. I don't see anywhere in the scriptures a gift given so that other Christians can see you and think, oh, wow, he's really holy. He's really good at speaking in special gibberish language. I, in fact, I don't see any special gibberish language at all in the New Testament. 
I see people equipped to speak in other languages for the furtherance of the gospel. Wrestle with that. Disagree with me? That's fine. But look to God and let the Spirit be sovereign, not you. He gives gifts for the common good and the building up of the body. Second point about uh, gifts beyond that. He takes who we are and reorients us to Jesus to glorify Christ. So it's not like he mentions the gift of administration in this chapter. What an exciting gift, right? Isn't that the one that you all pray for all the time? I, I, I long for the gift of administration. But it, it's not like you just wake up one day and you read the Bible and, whoa, I know Excel. Oh, I'm going to go and make the most elaborate spreadsheets you've ever seen. That, that's not how the spirit works, I don't think. It seems like he takes who you are and who he's made you to be. He takes you. You are a created being. But he makes you a new creation by taking who you are and putting you into service of the King Jesus. So you take your spreadsheet abilities and now you're using them for the glory of God and the good of your neighbor. Not just for yourself to make yourself a lot of money. Right? Right? We're actually seeking to use our gifts for the Lord. And sometimes the Spirit does some supernatural stuff. But oftentimes, He's simply reorienting who you are, what you are, and your created gifts to serve not self, but to serve God. Love is greater than gifts in all these things. And that's Paul's own point. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You'll just be annoying. That's what Paul is saying. And so we first seek love. We seek the fruit of the Spirit. And in fact, that brings us back to the night Jesus was betrayed because Jesus himself said, it's by this that everyone will know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. That is life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit is living in the presence of God, anchored in the Word of God, filled with the power of God for faith and repentance, to see Jesus, to want Him, to become more like Him, and bear witness to Him in the Spirit as He bears witness in us and as we bear, bear witness in our words and our ways and in our common life together. Spirit matters today because the Holy Spirit breathes the life of God into his people. Friends, if, if you share this conviction with me, if you take a risk, I, I invite you today uh, to read that EPC Essentials Statement of Faith here in a moment. But if you're here today and, and you sense that I, I've known about Jesus, but I don't know that I've known him. He's been words on a page to me. This is why the gift of the Spirit was given, that you would know God that you would know Jesus Christ, that your veil would be lifted and you could behold his beauty. Today, if you long to see Jesus, I just invite you to have this prayer in your heart. Lord, Holy Spirit, teach my eyes to see. Holy Spirit, take away the veil. Let me see Jesus. Lord, the Lord is merciful. I know he will answer that prayer. So... Let's read the essential statement and then we'll uh, pray together. The Holy Spirit has come to glorify Christ and to apply the saving work of Christ to our hearts. He convicts us of sin and draws us to the Savior. In dwelling our hearts, he gives new life to us, empowers and imparts gifts to us for service. He instructs and guides us into all truth and seals us for the day of redemption. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, in your humility, Holy Spirit, that you serve us to help us to see Jesus, to see his glory, his work on our behalf. So, Lord, I pray you'd remove that veil from us. Even those of us who've trusted in you, Lord, we, we put on blinders of our own making. And so we ask that you would break those down again. Fill us with a big vision of Jesus and lead us onward for his glory. Amen.